coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. GDPR is the next and natural extension of, okay, so now the data is protected. What are the rights that people have with their data that you store? So what are the data rights around information that a company holds about Chris Parham? And what can I do with that? All of that data protection part and the cybersecurity was already in place. What GDPR overlays is subject rights. The thing about the GDPR, whether we like it or not, is that it's forcing us to do the right things when it comes to sensitive data and IoT. While there's certainly a burden to bear, Following its regulations on subject rights, for example, is a guidebook on the right way to handle consumer privacy. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, I speak with Chris Parham about the first steps to compliance and how to take them. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is for business leaders and managers employing the Internet of Things for their business or the business of their customers. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair, and I interview the industry's leading authorities to find out how they use IoT to improve business and create value. If you like this show, subscribe to it on iTunes and go to iotinc.com to check out my complimentary articles, videos, meetups, and webinars. In the next episode, we're going to move on to blockchain. I have to admit that I was relatively ignorant about the technology until just recently. It's got a lot of hype right now, so I'm rounding up a number of experts so we can all learn about it and cut through the hype to see if it really makes sense for business or if it's just shiny tech. I believe the former, but we'll all see together. Now, if you have a subject you think would be valuable to everyone listening, send me an email. I'm at bruce at iotinc.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. I have a lot of ideas, but at the same time, I'm sure there's some better ones out there. And with that, let's get back to the GDPR. With me today on the IoT is Chris Parham. Chris is founder and CEO of File Facets. He's provided information governance solutions to the largest companies and governments for over 10 years as a consultant before pivoting his company to File Facets in 2015. Today, GDPR is a big focus. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much. So file facets, where where'd that name come from? Actually, that's a good question. Um, came up the other day. Uh, file facets is a, a, a facet of information in the information governance space is a piece of metadata that describes the content or the context around the files that we were at the time processing. Where we where our our history comes from is uh, in the information governance design, so building out taxonomies and metadata models and those kinds of things, and then and then transitioning mm-hmm. uh, file holdings, uh, from shared drives and SharePoint, those kinds of things, into a more classi- uh, classified ma- uh, system and migrating it into enterprise content management solutions. And, and, and so that's kind of where we started in the information governance space and a facet is though is the metadata that is tied to that object uh, that you know gives it context and describes what it is. So now in the past, so it sounds like obviously you've been working you've been working in this area of information governance for for quite a while. Where is this metadata that you're talking about generally used? How and how is it used? Oh yeah, good. Um, so there's actually three kinds of metadata. One, one is a process piece of metadata. So, so you, you tie things like dates and, and requirements to that metadata and it, and it helps you work that content through a workflow. Okay. Another piece of metadata uh, is a, a construction piece of metadata. So it ties 
uh, it defines two pieces of information that that using metadata cross references each other and and together that makes a record. So so an example, great example is a an email with an attachment. Mm-hmm. So inside that inside that object, there would be a piece of metadata that says this this attachment that is sitting out here in the ether somewhere is tied is tied to this this email the body of this email and that metadata uh, defines that relationship okay and 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 then there are a, the third type of a uh, piece of metadata is life cycle management so things like uh, retention schedules and um, access controls and those kinds of uh metadata that defines how long you keep something or who can who can access it what you can do with it when you've accessed it those kinds of uh, that kind of metadata defines the life cycle of the object so these types of metadata which i like it actually it puts a nice uh, structure around metadata and it's very applicable to iot right. but these uh, these three forms of metadata where have they been used i mean over the last 10 years you know in your experience <laughs> Pretty much everywhere well, it, in offices, but I mean, I'm trying yeah. to, you know, I'm just trying to understand, you know, where is this, yeah, where yeah. is this come and, yeah. you know, what's forcing this? It, because it sounds like it's very structured, so there, there's obviously behind well, it. Well, I, I kind of chuckle when you ask the question because, because 10 years ago, uh, when we were, when we were really diving into this space, uh, initially, it wasn't used very often. It was, you know, there was a lot of talk around it, there's a lot of work around developing it, but, um, and, and developing the systems and the, and the structures to put the content into, but there wasn't a lot of um, process work being done in the information governance space. So, pri- so, so like 10 years ago, uh, strong metadata usage in transactional systems, you know, billing systems, invoicing systems, those HR systems. Um, but in the information governance space, it was really in its infancy and, and it's, and it's, been this last, you know, the, the journey that we've been on since really 2005 that we have uh, seen an incredible adoption, an explosion really in the information governance space uh, because of the cloud and, and the internet and the uh, availability of software to organizations that historically couldn't afford it. So, so as I say, ten, 10 years ago, we were talking about systems like FileNet, okay. OpenText, uh, at the time it was LiveLink, um, or even eDocs. Mm-hmm. And, and those were big mega systems that were mil- many millions of dollars, and, and most organizations couldn't afford either the software or the resources required to implement it. Now we have the availability of, you know, things like Office 365 or M-Files or NetDocs and, and these smaller up and coming web based solutions mm-hmm. that are, you know, bill, billing out at as low as $10 a month, $20 a month per user. And, and so virtually every organization in the world is, is now using cloud based enterprise content management systems. And so it's just been an, an amazing thing to watch and being buried in it like we are, you know, sometimes uh, you, you lose that, you, you lose focus on that and, and, and you have to pop your head up and go, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> that These last few years have just been amazing for us people in the information governance space. Now, is the is the term information governance is this just a generic, or is it, or did it uh, come from a particular industry? Yeah, good. Um, it's it's kind of the latest thinking around um, the the value of the of information, right? So so the history has been records management. The, the, how we got to information governance as a term really is rooted in. In records management, it moved from records management to document management. It moved from document management to knowledge management. Um, and then kind of back and forth a few times for a couple of years. And then, it, and then it settled on information governance because in the past it was really about controlling that object and, and how long you needed to keep it. Right, right. Now it's understood that uh, because 
it's especially with the internet and and internet systems, you know, keeping something. Um, I mean, there's some talk of of a value of of, of not putting any re- restrictions on how long you keep things, and so then if you are going to go down that path, you need to govern that object more than just control it, and so uh, you need to be able to, you know, wrap really complex systems around something that that in the past has not been terribly complex mm-hmm. and so you need uh you know who can access something you're, you're putting security around something you're putting um usability around something you're putting a you know user experience is actually part of information governance now because we want to ensure that that people are are taking advantage of what of the resources that are available to them and so and so what what falls within that category called information governance is now so broad uh, compared to what it was when it was knowledge, document, or records management. Okay. So that's where it came from. Oh, yeah. No, no. That's a good history lesson, actually, and, and I didn't realize it because I've heard of knowledge management. I've heard of, I guess, uh, record management. So you're saying this is the evolution of it. And where – and so, you know, for our listeners – I know a lot of them are thinking, oh, okay, digital twin, you know, this is the data that we store for physical mm-hmm. objects with the models that we use for purposes. So is this access control and th- and the different wrappers around the data, Is how is that implemented? Is it implemented at the database level where you're just putting in fields, or is it actually do you require a completely different system. Where, where is this? And I know we're going to dive into this, but but at a high level, so, where is this taking place? So the answer to that is um, it de- it depends. <laughs> it depends on the system okay. that's implemented. Right. So and and it depends on your level of 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 risk tolerance and those kinds okay. of things. So so there are good and for enterprise content management systems like. Open Text Content Server or FileNet or even M Files, those kinds of systems, they they deploy uh, access control within their system, and it would be at the document level. Now there are uh, there's control, and then there's control, and so there are other systems like uh, you know Titus Labs or that that classify content and let you better control what you can do with it. So then it it lays on top of an ECM and an enterprise content management system and and defines whether something is allowed to be emailed or printed or accessed or copied. Mm-hmm. Those kinds of mm-hmm. more granular controls on that object, but it it still, you know, is it's directed at the at each object and and sort of managed at a database level. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna we're, we're gonna get into this a little bit later on because that's coming off of an IoT system. You know, for example, will be unstructured. You know, uh, part of it's gonna be is gonna be coming yeah. from sensors, so it's gonna be very raw. We we'll metadata associated with it, but it's very raw. And I don't think it's practical everything through you know, at, at a document level. If you're working at an access kind of document level. That's not going to cut it, but I don't want to get there now. I want to just sort of put that out there for everybody. But we'll get that when we we'll get to when we start talking about how do we implement VPR uh, compliance solutions. But why don't we start, uh, Chris, by you giving a bit of background about yourself and specifically, you know, how you're you're getting involved in the Internet of Things. Um, I've been in the information governance space my whole career, okay. so it's over 25 years now, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, if you could see me, I got a little gray hair. Uh, but what what I was specifically, uh, you know, my my expertise was in the design and implementation of taxonomies. And so from and and from the end, the first design of file facets, um, it was always to be a uh, internet based solution uh, to manage processes and classification of content mm-hmm. and so and so in terms of the internet of things we have um, the root of our solution has always been there and and it's and and we are absolutely a SaaS uh, solution today and and are available uh, that way and so um, without diving too much into that 
just to give a background of where we come from, it, it's it's also my opinion that that metadata being is the lifeblood of these systems, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whether whether it's on prem or on the internet, and so. Um, we are rooted in the foundations of what you need to succeed um, in in an internet-based uh, content management solution, for sure. So now, are you finding? I mean, it sounds like uh, information government governance has been more on the enterprise level, and I guess that could, that that's a pretty broad term. But that's right. Where are you seeing traction in the Internet of Things? Is that also within the enterprise? So that's bringing IoT solutions with enterprise, or just give me a little bit of yeah. So um, well, the traction from our perspective is it, it's more around the machine learning and AI and and deploying from a, an internet based solution into the enterprise. Uh, both, but what's exciting for us is that it's no longer the capital E enterprise, as I was mentioning earlier about, about web-based content management solutions. It mm. is now more about, uh, deploying into virtually every organization in the world, uh, every small and medium-sized organizations that no, historically weren't able to take advantage of these solutions. Because of the democratization of software through the internet, we are, we're providing, we're able to, and, and companies like us are able to provide, uh, very advanced solutions using advanced technologies like machine learning and AI at, at frankly rates that, that these small organizations can afford and, and help them be compliant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, managing things like PII and those those kinds of objects that are coming from the internet and going to the internet, right? So, so it's really cool. So now, if I'm understanding you, you're saying is that yeah, I mean, enterprises, big E, yeah. little E, they've been uh, gathering data, there, or there's been data that they can gather for eternity. Right. I mean, but now with the Internet of Things. There's a different source of data. It could be, you know, directly from a product, for example, or from or their customers using their product. Now, this is where you're starting to see the you know, the the ideas from an EDM being applied to T. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And 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 the cool thing is that um, it, it's also an explosion of volume as well, right? So um, right. because because the sources now uh, that are available to an organization aren't limited to their their own domains, um, they have they have the the web at their fingertips and and every resource available to them is coming into their organization as they find it and as they need it and so that that availability of content and the availability of knowledge and information is just um something that i didn't actually think i'd ever see for sure um and and it's and it's something that um, is an incredible opportunity for companies like ours to assist these organizations in controlling it, understanding it, uh, protecting themselves from it, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. As far, yeah. as, or from themselves, <laughs> themselves from themselves, right? Exactly, that's right. Um, and so, and so, that's the Internet of Things as has just exploded what is available to these organizations. And and now they're needing to address new and different challenges because of it. Well, we've been talking on the policy side for quite a bit, and I know later we're going to talk about technology, but let's go to policy now. And I'd like to first get your take on the GDPR. and Or maybe maybe let's step back a little bit further than that and – where does the comparison at a very high level, or what would you, how would you compare um, data privacy, information privacy regulations uh, between the EU and Asia, just at a high level? Yeah, good. Um, I've actually been traveling in all of these regions for the last 
year, 18 months, uh, discussing this exact topic. Mm -hmm. and, and what it boils down to is that they all have virtually the same guidelines. Okay. Virtually. I mean, there's, there's some, there's some minor differences and, but really what has added a new level of sophistication to the problem is the, the penalties involved in not meeting the obligation. And so if you were to ask me what the one thing between these three regions is, is that the EU has defined a very strict and pretty large penalty regime around not meeting the obligations which is for, which is forcing other organizations to uh, other regions um, to address that mm -hmm. and and so the other thing that the EU has done is not limited regionally what organizations must which organizations must comply with their particular regulation which is the general data protection regulation what do you mean by what do you mean by that any organization that sells to store yeah. stores information about an EU citizen yeah. is obligated to comply with GDPR and falls within the penalty regime if they if they don't comply now uh, another interesting thing uh, we are file facets is Canadian. Uh, we're we're based in Canada, um, and so we have some deep understanding of the Canadian environment. And and it, Canada recently signed an um, an agreement with the EU for uh, a free trade agreement. Within that free trade agreement is an obligation uh, on Canada's part to kind of normalize our. Um, Regulation, which is the acronym is PIPADA. Mm -hmm. In Canada. The, the, the actual name. Uh, yeah. It, but uh, so, so, so PIPADA now needs to be normalized to GDPR standards. So by January 2018, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but it has to level the playing field. And so Canada will be obligated to implement penalties that are similar to GDPR. I bring that up because I I suspect that um, those kinds of things are going to uh, to be um, propagated into other regions as well. So if a, a free trade agreement is is defined between the US and the EU, those kinds of penalties will will come into play as well. Um, ASEAN uh, has their own set of of privacy rules, and uh, again, they are being revamped as we speak, based on GDPR and the and and the obligations that are defined in GDPR, um, as well as the penalties that are defined there. So that EU regulation is really had a ripple effect around the world, primarily because. In my opinion, primarily because the obligation of these foreign companies to meet GDPR uh, makes it probably, I'll say, I'll use the word easier uh, for those jurisdictions to implement new and better regulations around privacy. Right, right. And it, it kind of gives them uh, an impetus to do that or, yeah. or gives them a, a reason to do that. So yeah. what you're saying is high level, you know, whether it's America, the European uh, Union or region or the region, these best pra these are best practices and they've been pretty much tied by governments around the world. However, the difference, and this is obviously why we're talking today, but is the, the EU's taking the lead on this, right? They're at, well, yeah, they're taking the lead yeah. on this. Absolutely. And they are encoding it, putting it yeah. into law regulations. And like you said, just because if you want to sell into Europe and you want to sell your products to a EU citizen, then you too, you being a company, have to all these laws. And so that is interesting because what you're saying is that you're starting to see this effect yeah. um, in different countries by That's this right. pending May, right, 2018. So May 2018, um, a few months away, we still got, what, seven, eight, something like that months away. But you're starting to see that as maybe speeding up the regulatory, uh, I guess, process in, in different regions in the world? Oh, absolutely. 
absolutely. Um, Canada, for example, would not be having this conversation if it wasn't for GDPR. Right, right. And if it, and if it wasn't for the free trade agreement. So, so the, and they're going to be implementing or, or presenting a new set of, of rules uh, by January 2018 in advance of, yeah, of May. May, the May 25th deadline. Interesting. So, yeah, it's, it's absolutely... It's actually it's it's forcing it's forcing the issue. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting because you also mentioned Love and Field because this is something you know that I talked a little bit about on this podcast and and written a little bit about it uh, in my newsletter and that is this you know I recently traveled to Europe as well and yes. and. Right. Innovation versus hints. <laughs> in Europe, it seems yes. everybody is so focused on complying that they're putting all their energy there. And elsewhere in the world, and I'll speak specifically in North America, there is the opposite. There's we got, we got to make money, and then we'll figure out this compliance stuff. Do you have uh, do you have any observations along those lines, or opposite from those lines that you can share? No, I I I hadn't thought of it that way, but. It's been kind of uh, needling at me as at me as well that that exact thing because here is a we are as a company selling into the EU mm -hmm. primarily I mean we're selling around the world but but we're really focused right now on May 25th sure and every once in a while I think to myself boy that's there is a real cost to doing business in the EU now with this regimen because. There's tangible things that you need to buy in order to satisfy this law, and so uh, which is which we don't have in North America. And so, having said that, though, because we sell into the EU, and because we actually have EU employees, um, file facets need to needs to be compliant with GDPR, and so it's. If you are not going to target EU citizens as a customer base, you won't have the same obligations and the same monthly outlay on complying with this regulation as a, as a company in, in the US. But on the other hand, then, you know, we're, we're a global economy now and anybody that's not thinking about selling into the EU is not thinking about growth and not thinking about being around in 10 years. So, Yeah, no, I agree. And just like the, well, what I'm pivoting on is this concept of leveling the playing field because that didn't plan. Yeah. The playing field is not level. And right now it's not level because you're right. There's a, there's an extra burden um, burden that you have to take on to be able to sell to the EU. But I got to tell you, Chris, this is just the beginning of the end. EU, they're leading the way. They're codifying it into regulations. And in my view, anyway, and, and I like your take, but in my view, it's just a matter of time. So you oh, can yeah. maybe be, you can maybe be uh, shaking this a little bit or, or, you know, kind of ignoring yeah. it for a little while, but it just has no, it be so interdepine, uh, intertwined that there's no choice yeah. that everyone listening on this podcast right now, you have to figure this out now. Is it May 18th or is it May? Is it May 5th? I can't remember the actual date. It's, it's May 25th. May 25th. That's 28th. it. May 5th, 2018. Um, you know whether you not whether or not you have to be all compliant on that exact date or not. I guess we can chat about that a little bit uh, later in our conversation. But you're going to have to figure this stuff out. And what I'm interested in talking to you about yeah. specifically, as I said, we've been talking about policy on this podcast in quite, you know, quite a few different episodes, specific episode on GDPR. But I know the next question is, well, how do we implement this? And this is why I was kind of digging a little bit earlier in this ECM price content management right. systems. I just don't see that unless it's my ignorance, but I just don't see that as a, as a mechanism to get there. But before we dive in, and I know we both dive in and everyone listening wants us to dive here, let's just do a level <laughs> set. Uh, I'd like to get your take on what is the GDPR. Just, just just give us your take. So so GDPR, actually, the, the, it, it's not a brand new concept. Well, it's not a brand new concept, period. It is just the latest uh, in an evolution of security requirements. Um, it, it happens to be centered in the EU, but... But as you said, you know, the, this is, this is going to happen. And, and as I said earlier, I'm, I'm witnessing it happening around the world, uh, where, where this kind of re regimen is 
being accelerated. But but GDPR in particular is the latest layer. It's the overlay on top of uh, what was the the DPD, the Data Protection Directive mm -hmm. in the EU. And the DPD was or is, but was the security part of that. Of the continuum, um, if you think about the requirement as an evolution, as as it has grown, the the DPD was around what security um, controls needed to be in place, what cybersecurity you had implemented, um, what ISO standards, what what internal processes you had in place to protect the data. Right, so it was just about okay. that. It was data protection and the security regimen around that data protection. GDPR is is the next and natural extension of okay. So now the data is protected. What are the rights that people have with their data that you uh, that you store? Right. So so what are the data rights around mm -hmm. information that a company holds about Chris Perham um, and, and what can I do with that? Mm -hmm. OK. And so so really it's all of that data protection part and the cybersecurity was already in place. Uh, what, what GDPR overlays is subject rights, uh, which includes uh, breach notifications, that kind of thing. And it also the, as I mentioned earlier, the very stringent penalties involved in not meeting um, your security and breach notification uh, requirements within within the um, regulation. So now you and, though, and those, but and by the way, those those penalties just to be just to be uh, really explicit, they're very high. Uh, they are up to four percent of sales. So, so 4% of revenue within an organization, um, if you have basic, if you have a, a major breach and you can't prove that you were, you were attempting to do your best within the GDPR regime, um, you can be fined as high as 4% of your revenue or 20 million euro, whichever is higher. And if you are shown to be doing your best, quote unquote, and but still have a breach that was deemed to be protectable. So 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 they they think that you the the, the authorities believe that you could have prevented that breach. It, it could be up to two percent of your revenue. So so it's a significant problem. And and the fees are of of not complying are making people sit up and take notice for sure. Now. I understand, like you do, that there's a wiggle room. Or I shouldn't say wiggle room, but there's a lot of gray area in this, yes. in these um, penalties. You know, are you trying yes. your best? Do you this in? And and yes. so, do, is your take that there's going to be a little bit of a, I guess, an easing in? I guess my real question is: is for everyone listening today, is your advice that on May 25th? this 100% sorted out or is this something that you know you should be along your way or what's your advice for for everyone listening right now with respect to 25th 2018 okay so so this is just my personal opinion sure i understand <laughs> so, please don't do what i do i'm about to say and then and then i get in trouble <laughs> but um i think my personal opinion is that there's that there's going to be levels of discretion within the within the authority, uh, and, and it's going to be based on a couple of things. One, the size of your company and and the sort of security profile mm -hmm. of your company. And I think personally that um, showing effort is going to mitigate any part of the risk that you might incur at a breach. So my recommendation is that you that that every organization needs to move down the path between now and May 25th. It's just not feasible that all 23 million companies in the EU and probably 200 million companies around the world that are affected by this regulation are going to be fully compliant within by by May 25th. But but there are some tangible 
things that you need to do that that won't cost a lot of money, that won't um, that won't affect your operations uh, in in a in a very huge negative way uh, that that you need to get done and start working on right now, and so that so that you are down the path by by the time May twenty fifth rolls along. So what would those be? Uh, well, give us a yeah, high level. Yeah, yeah. At, at a high level, there are four things that you need to do. If, uh, assuming that you are DPD compliant, um, and, and that's a, that's a pretty big con- assumption. Okay. But um, even if you aren't DPD compliant, there are there are a few things that you can do today that will help help you define what you need to do. First of all, to be compliant with GDPR and to move you down the path. Uh, one of the big ones is uh, that 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 you need to do in order to be compliant is to define explicitly what data stores you have, where they are, what their structures are, and and start to do an inventory of both your content and your information governance practices. Okay, yep. and so going out and getting an inventory of your content and understanding PII, personally identifiable information that you have in those uh, collections of data is, is the starting point and it can be done and it can be done right away. Um, that will give you an understanding of your risk and it will, and it will help define any new processes that you need to, uh, define and implement in advance of May 20th. So, mm-hmm. so that's a, that's a quick win. And, and you can take that, um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, around, around defining your processes and ensuring that you can, they're, they're calling it, um, privacy by design within the GDPR framework. And so ensuring that there are Based on the inventory that you've taken and the risk profile that you um, that you have within your organization, you can define processes that are specific to each system or workflow uh, to protect any PII that might be out there that that maybe it's in the wrong place or maybe it has to be in a in a in a less protected space. So therefore, you need other processes. Uh, in place to to protect it better or to keep an inventory or that kind of thing, and so that's that's also something that can be done in advance without incurring a lot of cost and a lot of uh, disruption to your business. No, those are two. I mean, those two good suggestions. And you mentioned privacy by design, but really doing the the first stage of security by design is also. Inventory. Where's your Where's your data being stored? And in the second part, where you were talking about right. in terms of risk, and that is looking at the attack vectors and trying to understand the ability of of them occurring. Then what would be the liability if they do occur? Multiply the two of those two numbers together, and your risk factor for each one of these data uh, store data or or right. whatever uh, however you want to talk about it. Well, I would so that, that everyone should be doing anyway, and right. everyone should know what they have. <laughs> they should at least know where where there could be potential attacks, because this is also going to prioritize your security energy. You know where you're going to put That's money in security. And then the second one you bring up That's makes right. a lot of sense too. Is okay, it's planning. Okay, now that we have an invent, now we have inventory. We know where things are. Perhaps we go to the next step and actually associate a risk for each of these different forms of data. We then look at the PII in particular, and we say, okay, for these for these uh, pools of that um, where have uh, PII, let's figure out what are we going to do. What's the process here? What's what are we going to do? What's our plan? Is that kind of what yeah. you're saying? That's exactly okay. it. And and that plan can be as simple as you know. Move that content somewhere sure. super secure, and, move it. Yeah. or you know, move it or or get rid of it. Frankly, you know, yeah. maybe it's maybe you're holding risk that you don't even need because it's it's redundant or it's obsolete, and you could actually delete it as even even outside of the of the normal information governance you know records retention process. Um, it could be a duplicate. It could be a. It could be an 
an old disused piece of content that from from an ex client or you know whatever it is it, it you know run run some what we call rot processes against that content and and just get rid of the risk altogether and, and if we put it into the terms of IoT one of the things I recommend to my clients is priority date on all your data and if you haven't used it or transformed it or stripped it of the PII by then and get rid of it and that you know that's kind of that's it just again just puts a it puts a, a ceiling on that risk that you were talking about a little bit earlier right that's it so 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 the, in in the information governance space we would we would that's a that's a retention schedule right is what you're talking about you know put in put in a date on a, an object that says when this date is reached if if the if nothing's been done to it, hasn't been accessed, hasn't been modified, get rid of it. And correct me where I'm wrong, but back to the GDPR, everything has to do with PII, and in particular, not necessarily even just stripping out the PII directly, but all the clues that could lead to someone to get the PII. So if, Chris, if you were to, if listeners were then to say, okay, we have this data, we get rid of the PII, we get rid of, let's see, an IP address that it came in on, it's potentially that could be used as a way yeah. to, you know, the GPS your way to that uh, that PII. Are you safe in, uh, with respect to the GDPR? That's that's not... The, Stripping out the PII. The, the point of GDPR is not to... is not to um, delete or get rid of PII. It's to, it's to control it mm -hmm. and to, and to put some of that control in the subject's hands. Okay. And so when we talk about subject rights, um, there, there is PII that is stored on everybody that is a customer or an employee that is required for other regulations, by the way. You know, not, right, right. I, I can't just delete, um, an employee record. Just because it has PII in it, and an employee has has uh, implemented his his right to be forgotten, uh, because there are tax laws and and other regulations that that obligate me to store that in a secure manner. So 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 just deleting the content um, is not meeting your GDPR obligation. It's really securing it and controlling it and putting processes in place that allow um, the subject to to request certain um, actions to be taken with their content. And so and so that that is there's actually four broad uh, access right or, or rights within that are that are bestowed upon a subject in GDPR mm -hmm. uh, subject being a person whether it's a client or an employee, and and those and there are there are subsets of this stuff, so it gets quite complicated. But at a general level, um, there there are four rights: uh, the right to access it. So so if I'm a subject, um, I can't. I know that you need to store some of my personal identifiable information. Um, I need. I have the right to know what you store. And so I can I could simply request what it, what is the data that you're that you've collected on me, okay? And and an organization has a, a time frame within which they need to um, to uh, honor that request. Uh, right right to be forgotten is a really big one uh, because it's 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 fairly complicated. Um, as I said earlier, my if if I um, execute my right to be forgotten and I submit a request to a company or an ex-employer, that organization doesn't just carte blanche go find everything that says Chris Parham on it and and delete it uh, because there are other reasons why that company is storing that information and there are other regulatory requirements that that they need to uh, satisfy with that information right so so there's a so again I, I talked earlier about process one of the processes that needs to be defined is 
how is an organization going to satisfy the right, right to be forgotten part of that? Um, a third right is the right for data portability. If I am, um, I have a, a, a dentist or an ophthalmologist, um, I want my record, I, I decide I'm going to, I'm moving or I, or I just simply want to change doctors. I have a right to that content and I, and I have a right to move that content from one provider to another. Um, again, there needs to be processes in place, but, but that's an important right. And finally, or, or a product, or, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you could be moving that data from yeah, a product absolutely. to another. Of course. And so then, uh, finally, the right for notifications. So breach notifications. There's really stringent rules around how quickly and, um, and, and how to notify me if there's been a breach. Uh, basically, an organization has 48 hours. I have a right to know within 48 hours that my PII has been breached um, from that organization. Okay. So th those are the four big rights. So being able to access uh, the data that the company uh, organization has on you, having the right yes. to be forgotten, including if that company had maybe even shared that data, PII-related data yeah. with other organizations, so being able to kind of erase yes. that as well. Data portability with service providers and products, and the last one being i got to be notified, and I want to be notified within 48 hours, and I don't know, maybe my inbox is going to be pretty full <laughs> on this one, but those are the four. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and as we were talking about earlier, you were correct. Uh, you're correct to say that you can't erase all PII. But what you can do is, when you were doing that inventory, is you can make sure the PII is in one place, and when you transform that data, you don't necessarily keep <laughs> the PII with it, right? And and that's just maybe a yeah. best practice in terms of getting back exactly. to that in the risk. All exactly. right. So so we've got from a policy point of view, we've got an overview. Now the next question, in everyone's mind. How do I do this? Am I going to have to, I mean, at a, at a low level, you know, shiny metal angle or, or level, then I could put some fields in with all my data and I could then, you know, write custom code that would search my database and then based on the records, it would the fields and if that was a field and do something there. But I'm, I'm guessing there might, there, there's probably some other solutions. So can you give us, first of all, a highlight of the different categories of solutions? For our listeners, now again, remember, this is not going to be this is going to be IoT kind of data. But uh, Chris, give us some high level. What are what are the high level options uh, that our listeners have to be able to meet uh, GDPR requirements? Yeah, good. Uh, within the GDPR, it actually does obligate each organization to put both processes and tools in place to meet subject right obligations as part of the regulation. Now to that now that's where the categories come in, right? So so yes, there needs to be tools and processes in place, period. Those tools can be Windows Explorer. They can be they can be your Azure um, Azure um, management tools. It, mm -hmm. it can be mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a third party overlay to manage this process. Right. Okay, so that annual doing yeah. database manipulation manually is to what you're saying. Totally can totally be manual. Okay. And highly recommend that when you have um, you know, a small company that is, you know, maybe they have some EU employees for, you know, here's a good example. They have a they have a, a, a data center in Ireland, but they're really only selling in Texas. And so their GDPR obligations are around those employees, not about not not EU hmm. clients. Not their, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So 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 maybe they have 20 employees that they need to keep track of. Well, their GDPR obligations can be as simple as keeping keeping track of those 20 employee files mm -hmm. and having a system in place for ensuring that if one of those 20 leaves or, or, or actually doesn't have to leave, they can, they can um, ask to, a right to access subject right and 
so they can they can simply have a process in place that says, okay, here it is, and I'm going to uh, courier it to you or FTP it up to a secure site, um, something like that. Right. Okay, so so that's okay. that's manual. basically manual yep. with some good search tools, perhaps. On the other, on the very far end, of the other scale is um, compliant platforms that are built not just for GDPR, but they're they're good for GDPR, very good for GDPR in the sense that they are, um, if you are in a highly regulated industry and a very secure, you know, the nuclear power plant, those kinds of things. Those kinds of platforms are very good to manage GDPR as well as HIPAA, as well as um, environmental regulations and and all of that, as well as very you know tracking your security and breaches and those kinds of things, right? So 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 one end it's virtually manual. On the other end, there is yep. a a, a extremely robust platform uh, in the millions of dollars uh, to implement, and it manages everything uh, about all of your uh, compliance issues. And then there are uh, kind of combinations of that, uh, other solutions sort of in the middle ground that offer uh, GDPR-specific um Solutions to kind of mid-market um, that are not built necessarily for um, every industry and the different regulations for every industry, uh, you know, for environmental, transportation, or mm -hmm. or energy, but but really specific to GDPR and overlay that on top of your current systems, right? So so. And what are these class of uh, products? Well, I mean, we just we we just call it the kind of the, the mid market G, uh, GPR solutions okay. because you know there there aren't a, frankly there aren't a lot of them out there because of everybody's kind of trying to solve that right. Um, so these are GDPR specific in the pen industry, and specific. they are to help you That's yeah, meet compliance needs. All right. Yeah. Now, where where they've come from. Um, is very much like where file facets come from, where they they mm -hmm. they were built for a specific thing like an information governance solution or something like that, and and they pivoted, they built that really cool solution that does some really cool AI or machine learning or uh, auto classification, and pivoted pointed that toward a GDPR solution so that it automates the the um, identification of the PII, the tracking of the PII, and the, um, the the management of the subject rights. There are several on the market, and, you know, they're all – the technology is all good. Lots of, of how they go about doing what they do mm -hmm. is generally um, really solid. And things like machine learning, those are all kind of table stake things now, mm -hmm. and, and that's where that's where um, automation and innovation meets the very practical requirement of satisfying this regulation. And so, and so, machine learning in this context is identifying not not worrying about just PII, but but worrying about or identifying that content that likely has PII in it. So. So if you can if you can run a system and and teach your system uh, sure. and what a say a health record looks like, then I don't have to necessarily know who that's about. But if it is a health record, I know that I can put a higher risk profile on that object and process it in a different way than than some other country. Now is this to identify it for, or is this actually to I don't know, package it in a slightly different way in a slightly different data store? Well, it's both, actually. So okay. So that's, that's just it. So, so once you've identified it, now you can run automated processes that define uh, based on what it is. So, so you find a health record and you automate uh, uh, one process. You find a, an invoice, you automate a different process. Um, 
you find something very low risk, like a an invitation of some sort, um, then you can perhaps even run a, a, a delete process on that because it's it's probably rot anyway. So so all I mean is that the advanced technologies that are that are available today um, that have come from things like information governance and and from the legal profession and those kinds of things applied to a compliance system like a GDPR solution is taking those machine learning technologies and finding content that is of high risk so that you can protect it and process it regardless of the fact that it actually has PII about a, a particular person. So in the context of IoT, uh, let, let's say you're deploying a product into your customer, you're deploying a product into your into your own, it, that's not going to change that much. I mean, it, you know, I can understand the different data that's coming in from different sources, but from a product that you're either bringing into your company or a product that you're selling, it's going to do certain things. And I think... Um, Maybe, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're going to understand the classifications. You're going to understand what to, you know, and how to store them. But I guess what I don't understand is, or what I like a little bit more, I guess, uh, detail on is I'm assuming this has to onto your database, but give me a system idea of what, what's happening here. How are you attaching it? What, what, you know, where does it fit into, into the system? Well, I think, I think. Different products do it differently, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it as generalized as possible. But the idea is that that these these compliance solutions sit on top of the repositories and connect into them. Okay, so that so that um, there might be a connector into Salesforce and into M files and into SharePoint and your shared drives and your laptops and your desktops and your email. Um, and, and it goes out and indexes that content and presents that in a, um, a single view providing the end user that maybe the data protection officer, which we haven't talked about yet, but, um, the data protection officer, an understanding of the inventory that we talked about earlier. So, so where everything is, what's in it, what's in each repository, uh, what risk is in each repository at any given time. Um, it, it also will give the DPO um, or the or the process data process officer, the uh, or data protection officer, the ability to um, run. Searches against that index and um, and and process the search results based on whether it's a, a semantic indexing or uh, perhaps it's um, regular expression searches or full text searches, whatever. However, that system is designed to implement the the discovery of that content across your entire holding, and so regardless of which repository it's in. This your your obligation remains the same, and so you need to be able to satisfy that obligation, whether it's in an email system or um, a, an unstructured content like a like a shared drive or a or a laptop, um, or in a very structured system like SharePoint or SAP or anything like that. Well, in the context of IoT. I mean, we're we're really talking about a data lake. It could be a federated data lake, but it's you know we're talking yeah. we're talking straight on databases. And I think what you're saying here, the way that this works is that you provide access to these tools to your database. You're going to point uh, you know to where obviously, in the context of I O, be the digital twin, and that's going to be the data structure that's associated, uh, the different data structures associated yeah. with that physical product, mm -hmm. you know, the thing. And then it's going to be able to query that database. It's going to be able to perform potentially then these subject rights, right? It's going to be able to pull out the data. If someone's request, delete the data. If someone's asked to be forgotten, uh, pull it and put it maybe in a CSV file if, if they want yeah. data portability. And obviously yeah. the last one being, yeah, just, yeah, something's happened. So it's notified. Is that, yeah. is that kind of a conceptually a good way to think about it? Yeah, except that I would add, um, a level of, I, 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 
want to point out that it isn't just the database content. So it's not just about stuff that's that's structured. Uh, you really do in this context. So 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 this is kind of where the IoT and sort of domain enterprise specific content. You know that the. the the processes are the same, mm-hmm. but I think you're pointing right. at different repositories, and so, and so the yes, the big data lakes are are where most of the processing happens, just because of the volume. But it it doesn't entirely satisfy the requirement. You still need to understand, protect, and present. Uh, unstructured content as well as part of this uh, your meeting your obligation. Okay, and that's what these uh, these mid-market uh, GDPR solutions provide then. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and this data, you know, this unstructured data would you know, would be in a data lake as well, so it's going to be it's going to have to a database. Yeah. Well, well Chris, we're, as we wind down, can you maybe tell us a little bit of um, about File Facet Solution and tell our listeners where they can find out what you and, and the company. Okay, so so the, I, I think that the the value proposition for File Facets is that because we are a hybrid cloud solution, we we do all this indexing and present a very robust solution or with machine learning and all of that, uh, but but in a distributed manner so we can roll up. As I was discussing earlier about uh, repositories across an enterprise, they can also be across mm-hmm. regions and and around the world and rolling up and having a single view of content around the world. So that that's kind of where, where we fit. We, we are one of those mid-market solutions uh, where a uh, really cool solution around Doing your inventory, helping you define your GDPR obligations, and then and then meeting your rights access, uh, your rights uh, obligations uh, within that framework. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so without making it into a big commercial, <laughs> uh, that that's kind of where we fit in the marketplace. Uh, where you can certainly find more information at www.filefacets.com, and um, Download a free dashboard if you'd mm-hmm. like uh, to see what our what our dashboards look like, that kind of thing. Excellent, excellent. This will uh, this has been very informative, and yeah, I think it's important to take the next step and start. I think your recommendations of the inventory and starting to identify processes that you need to. Take. But I think this has been helpful. I know it has been for me. Just to understand okay, what are the different ways we're going to do this, and so there are solutions that are being helped around the GDPR. Yeah. And if you can, you give our list a range in terms of costs for these mid-market uh, solutions. As low as kind of a thousand dollars a month, up to several hundred thousand dollars for a for an on-prem solution, mm-hmm. and then and then the bigger ones are in the millions for sure in the you know in the in the big compliance platforms. And is this uh, on the mid-market ones? Is this based on the num- amount of data you have, the number of transactions? What's the actual you know pivot uh, variable for the for the price? There, yeah, there's a couple of different approaches. Um, our approach is not on on size of repository; it's on functionality um, and and how many um, offices you have basically. Um, but other other solutions are based on si- number number of files or size of repository, um, you know that kind of thing. It, it's it's there are many uh, there there are a lot of on-prem solutions as well that that uh, are a perpetual license model. Um, as I said, they're they're in the hundreds of thousands of dollars in the mid-market range, um, and um, you know they're they're solid products. It just depends on, on your needs and, and how you want to uh, roll that out. Okay. And what would be the search term that that we would browse to kind of find? Oh, your URL, and I recommend everyone check out File Facets. But then what would be the search term that we would put in our browser to kind of see see what else is available? Well, first I'd say if I knew that, I would <laughs> I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, search, search for uh, GDPR compliance or um, solutions, solutions or yeah that like kind that. of thing yeah yeah 
Yeah, yeah. No, good point. That's a good point. All right, Chris. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you. Very innovative. Uh, good luck, and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, that was episode 91. 7 and 13, so not a big fan of the 91. To get an analysis of this episode, links to the things that were mentioned in the show, plus a transcript, go to the show analysis notes. They can all be found at iot-inc.com slash podcast. You'll see all the podcasts there, so you just have to search the one you want. If you've been enjoying this podcast, subscribe to it. That way you get every episode delivered right to your device. And there are three ways you can support the show. You can share it on your blog, personal or company, if you think others will find it of value. You can share it on social. I have the social buttons on each of the episode show analysis notes. And you can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. This is my favorite, trying to hit that number, 100. Just go to iotinc.com slash iTunes slash. It only takes one click or a little bit longer if you want to write your thoughts. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next time, may your path to IoT business be a private one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 